Okay, welcome back. Let's um, let's begin today with a word of prayer. Uh, we're going to do something a little different today and for the next few weeks, and I feel like asking for the Lord's special help in that uh, endeavor. So if you will, pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you today as a body, as one little corner and joint of your body, and ask you, Lord, to be present among us as we read your word together, even as you have been in the in your praises and in the prayers. I pray that your Holy Spirit would enlighten our eyes and make our hearts soft to hear your gospel in the passages that are before us. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to speak clearly and to, uh, to give our people um, your words of life today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, uh, in a few minutes we're going to be taking bread and wine, or grape juice as the case may be. And then, um, so I want to say a few things about that today. And I also want to mention, uh, by way of announcement, something that I didn't uh, think to, to share a second ago. On August 27th, we're going to be having a, a baptism service uh, for people in our little fellowship that have expressed a desire to be baptized. And um, Jerry and Anola have offered to uh, host a barbecue after that at their place. More details on that forthcoming, but I wanted to mention that we're going to be doing... Communion here at the end of the service today, baptism a little bit later in the summer. And I wanted to start today by saying, why are we doing those things? Why is it that we are going to take the bread and the wine today and have a baptism in August? What exactly will we be doing? What are the reasons for it? And what will it accomplish? And maybe a follow-up question, how important are these rituals, these observances, to the life of the gospel? We make a big deal around here about talking um, and dwelling on the benefits that are ours by faith. And uh, we talk about faith a lot here. We talk about the emptiness in our own hearts because of our own situations, because of the struggles and sufferings that we face, being something like faith. That shaking your fist in the right face is the cry of faith and saying, God, I'm dead. I'm empty. You have to save me now. And there's something non-physical about that. There's something very spiritual about the transaction that we always talk about between God and his people in faith. And so I want to spend the next few weeks really talk, investigating uh, the relationship between that in spiritual, invisible faith and the very physical, material stuff of things like the Lord's Supper and baptism. I want to talk about these questions. Why is it that we take the bread and the wine? Why is it that we introduce the water in the baptism service? And find out what the Bible has to say about them so that we can, maybe for the first time in a long time, be self-conscious about the things we say and the things we think with respect to these things. But I want to, before you get into that, ask you another question. Why should we be spending time investigating these things? I mean, Andrews, you're of a academic bookish turn of mind maybe you just want to have a little book study and spout your learning and your wisdom in front of the congregation and maybe that's a waste of time why take precious sermon time and we only meet once a week we only have just one little 45 minute session to to have a formal presentation of the love and grace of god to sustain us all week long why are we taking precious sermon time on some matter of ritual observance. Shouldn't we just stick to reminding each other of the love and grace of God in Jesus? Well, I want to set that question aside by saying, yes, we should. We should be doing that every Sunday. We should do nothing but that every Sunday. And any moment that we spend in this particular configuration where somebody is opening up the word and preaching it to the rest of us that isn't spent in reminding each other of the love and grace of God and Jesus is truly wasted. And so I want to double down and say that question is a well-founded question. Why indeed should we do anything but that? So I want to investigate the sacraments, as they're called, baptism and the Lord's Supper for the next few weeks, for no other reason than to remind us of the grace and love of God in Jesus Christ. So that as we take them, as we participate in them, we can be properly and fully reminded of the love and grace of God in Jesus Christ. So if you will, go along with me as we did over the last year through the book of Hebrews and followed Hebrews' guy and his course through the 
Old Testament priestly system. I want you to come along with me for the next few weeks leading up to the baptism service on August 27th and investigate what the Bible has to say about the sacraments. And let's see if we can't find in a real way, in a new way, in a profound way, the love and grace of God in Jesus as we look at them. So first of all, let's, uh, it, by way of introducing the subject, let's take up the question, what is a, a sacrament? We're very, it's a low church organization we got going on here, right? We're not, um, I, was at a, I was at an Anglican synod recently, I think I told you guys, and they have this phrase about how formal and liturgical you are, and it's how far up the candle you are in your, uh, in your Sunday morning service. And if we use that phrase, we are very far down the candle here, right? We don't put a lot of stock in rituals and observances. So I want to, but what we do instead is to say, what's in the Bible? What does the Bible have to say about subjects like this? So I want to turn our attention to a couple of passages in the Bible that have to do with the sacraments. And the first one is Matthew 28, 19. So if you would turn with me there, I'll get my handy dandy high tech Bible out here. A very familiar passage, which you have probably, probably could see as coming. But let me read the Great Commission to you. Jesus says in verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here we have Jesus in the Great Commission instituting, is the theological word for it, the sacrament of baptism, commanding his followers, his disciples, to perform this ritual observance when they bring new disciples into the kingdom, into the family. He says, in a sense, that the, the ritual of initiation into Christianity is baptism. Look back a couple of chapters in Matthew 26. In fact, I want to jump there real quick. Matthew 26. And I want to scroll down to verse 26. Matthew 26, 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so, and there's parallel passages for this, of course, Mark chapter 14, Luke chapter 22, where Jesus does with the Lord's Supper, as we call it, exactly what he did with baptism, commanding his followers to do it self-consciously as a ritual observance that is a mark of fellowship and membership in the kingdom of God, in the family of God. So here we have Jesus instituting two what we call sacraments. And I want to look at those passages and have you remember them as I just read them and ask yourselves a couple of questions. What sets these passages apart? Why are they unique? And how are they similar? So that together they belong in a separate category, a special category, a special category of of passages that we need to pay attention to and conceive of in particular ways. And I came up with three things. There are three things I want you to notice about these passages and about the sacraments generally. First of all, they describe rituals. They describe ceremonies. They describe what the, the church down through the ages has called liturgies, which is literally means works of the people. People get together and they say things, and they take things, and they perform ceremonies with those things. They're rituals. They have to do with physical elements. Water, bread, wine, words. Ever thought of words as physical things before? Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thereby saying, look, there's a right way to do baptism. You do a baptism by saying these words, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought about the fact that there are two physical elements in that ceremony? There's the water, two physical elements aside from the person being baptized, who is being baptized in his body. There's the water, 
that he's either sprinkled on his head or washing over him in some way. And there's the words, the sounds, the sound waves, the clicking of the tongue against the teeth when he says, in the name of the Father. That's a physical thing as much as it is a spiritual thing, right? So this ritual involves the things of earth, the things of matter, the things of substance. And it involves things of substance being imbued with some sort of spiritual reality in some way. Something is happening in this ceremony, right? That's the first thing about it. These sacraments are rituals at which something special, maybe even supernatural, takes place. Secondly, these are rituals that Jesus himself commands his followers to perform. And there's been a lot of theological controversy over this point, down through the ages, kind of came to a head in the 16th century. But these are the ones that the reformers and the uh, theologians that have come since the reformers of the 16th century, these are the ones that Jesus instituted, they say. And that the other ones that were the common, uh, commonly known as sacraments in the Catholic Church before then were not actually instituted by Jesus. We're not going to belabor that point. Suffice it to say that this is a Protestant church, and we hold to the five or six hundred year old idea that the sacraments are two, baptism and the Lord's Supper, because they were uniquely instituted by Jesus. So it's a ritual that Jesus himself, while he was in the flesh, said, do this. And then thirdly, the third thing about these passages, these sacraments, they have to do with the forgiveness of sins. Or more broadly speaking, they have to do with the dispensation of grace. The rituals that Jesus commanded us to perform are involved somehow in the channeling of grace from heaven down to earth. They're involved somehow in communicating or making effectual or some other term that we'll come up with in the next few weeks. The grace of God in Christ that forgives us of all our sins. They're connected to membership in the Christian community because of this grace, right? And you know this. This is not something new. In fact, uh, you're, maybe your eyes are glassing over already because you're saying, yes, yes, I know. Christians get baptized. Yes, yes, I know. We give them bread and wine every week or every month or every quarter, depending on how far down the candle we are. <laughs> say something I don't know. I'm not going to say anything you don't know, but I want you to listen and think and watch yourself think about these very familiar concepts because there's nothing more powerful than looking back at your own assumptions and saying, oh, look at that. That's what I think about that, and this is why. It makes that, that assumption that you have come alive and maybe even challenges you to think carefully about it. So I want to read you some verses where the connection between the sacrament and the forgiveness of sins is made explicit. Because it's, it's, it's tantamount to me saying that the sacrament is involved in some sort of causative way in the forgiveness of your sins. Which, if you think about it for a minute, is kind of a lot to say. And maybe even gets me in some hot water. And maybe you want to push back and throw a tomato at me. But look. Look at Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. This is Peter speaking in his famous um, Pentecost sermon, he said to them, uh, they, they said, brethren, what shall we do? As after he preaches the gospel to them, and they're smoked to the heart. And they say, what shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes an explicit connection between the right ritual ceremony of baptism and the forgiveness of sins. Look at Paul in Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, sorry, Romans 6, <coughs> verse 4. Starting with verse 3. Do you, not, do you not know, Paul says to the Romans, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The Apostle Paul explicitly, as explicitly as Peter did in Acts chapter 2, connects the rite, the ritual of baptism, with some sort of spiritual reality, with the death 
and later the resurrection of Jesus. That when we undergo the sacrament, something like that is happening to us. We are identified with Jesus in his death and later in his resurrection. And of course, Jesus himself, in the passages that I've already quoted in Matthew 26 and in Matthew 28, explicitly connects the sacrament with the forgiveness of sins. Explicitly connects the Lord's Supper with the forgiveness of sins in 26. And then in 28, connects baptism with membership in the family of grace. Membership in the disciples club, if you will. So there are three things then that set these passages apart that make sacraments what they are. They are a ritual of some kind that take the physical, something in the physical world, and by means of words, by means of, I don't want to say incantation, because there are big theological reasons why that is not the thing that's going on. By words, spiritual reality is connected to those physical things. A connection of matter and spirit that, has, that happens because of the power of God and by the command of God. But I want to follow this up with a question. That's what a sacrament is, okay? What is the function of ritual in the grand affair of our forgiveness? We have it from the scriptures that they're connected. But have you ever thought about the fact that maybe they ought not to be connected? <coughs> How can a ritual, a ceremony, be connected with the grand affair of the forgiveness of my sins? Why is there a physical, material, ceremonial dimension to this process especially since jesus has already come in the flesh once and for all especially since jesus has already made permanent sacrifice for those he came to save how many times has the sacrifice for sin that actually did the deed been performed i'll give you a hint once is there any need to do it again i'll give you another hint no is it damnable idolatry to do it again? Yes. Then why a ceremony? Why a ritual? Why is there a ceremonial dimension to salvation now? Especially since faith, that invisible action, that spiritual gift of God, that most non-material of all powers, is the foundation upon which our righteousness rests. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, but now in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness from God that is by faith. As it is written, the just will live by faith. In other words, live by something non-material. Live, live by an emptiness that's filled only by the Spirit of God and has nothing to do with the stuff of earth. Why is there a ceremonial dimension to that religion? Why does God command a ritual? He didn't need to. Surely, death has been defeated, right? Salvation has been bought for all his people. Faith dispensed as a gift to all whom God has chosen. And the sanctification and glorification of all his saints certainly and most assuredly fixed as a future triumph. There is no ritual necessary for salvation. As we talk about the sacraments, and I'm going to make the case in the next few weeks that they are very, very important, and we should do them very advisedly, and we should do them assiduously and well and repeatedly and often, I have to start the beginning of that process by saying there is no ritual necessary for salvation in the church of God. All of the physical things that needed to happen have happened. The crucifixion, the resurrection, the deed is done. So why does God command a ritual I think an answer to this question emerges for us if we rewrite the question above from why does God command a ritual to why does God offer a ritual and I want to talk about that for just a minute uh, and in order to do that I want you to turn to first John chapter 1 let's not ask why God commands a ritual let's ask why God offers a ritual and see if that helps us. 1 John 1, chapter 1. Sorry, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. 
the life was made manifest, and we've seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy, or in some translations, your joy, may be complete. What is John, as he writes 1 John, preoccupied with in that first chunk of chapter 1? Do you notice his preoccupation? His preoccupation with the verifiable, the touch and feel reality of the incarnation? Look, guys, we shook his hand. We saw, we heard with our physical eyes. We know that God is real and the gospel is true because we saw Jesus in the flesh and we touched Jesus in the flesh and we heard the sound waves coming out of his mouth and bouncing off our eardrums, our senses, meaning our physical selves were involved in an interaction with the invisible spiritual God. And that changed everything, and we want you to know about it. He made himself known, which means he made himself known physically as much as anything. So John's, this is all, all over this first chapter. He, in fact, the whole book of 1 John is about, look, I want you to know because I saw. But do you notice the, the uh, futility is the wrong word. Do you notice the trouble that he's in? in writing? Why, why is he writing the letter? To whom is he writing this letter? To whom is 1 John writing this letter? Well, I don't know exactly, but he's writing to people that didn't see. He's writing to people that weren't there. He's writing to people that live in a world from which Jesus himself has vanished, right? He's writing in a world where Jesus is not present physically. He's writing so that his readers may be encouraged about the physical reality of Jesus despite the fact that he is now gone. I want to put this first chunk of 1 John chapter 1 in my own words. This is, this is John speaking as I imagine him speaking with some subtext added in. This is not the word of God. This is the word of Andrews. I write to reassure you guys that it was real. In the material world, I saw it. I touched it. I tasted it. I felt it. Oh, man. I wish he was still here. Man, I wish you could still touch him and hear him and taste him and smell him like I did. I wish you could feel his enveloping embrace with your arms, with your body, like I did. I wish that in addition to the words about Jesus' death and resurrection that go in through your ears... There were pictures that can go in through your eyes and sensations that can go in through your skin and food that goes in through your mouth and smells that go in through your nose. I wish Jesus himself in the flesh were still around. It would be so encouraging to have his presence in those other ways as well. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you have ever said that? You know, the apostles had it easy. They could walk up to him and bang him on the shoulder and say, Jesus, how's it going? And he could slap him on the back. Wouldn't faith be easier if it was encouraged by physical presence? And we always respond, since Jesus isn't here, we always say, well, yeah, but we have the Holy Spirit, and so that's even better. But inside we say, yeah, it would be. I'd like it too. That would be great. So the question, why does God offer us a ritual? To answer this need, among other things. To answer this need with provision. To answer this question was, yes, of course I will. I wouldn't leave you altogether. In fact, I wouldn't leave you in any way. In fact, when I said, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, I meant in every way. God offers a ritual to fill with all possible meaning the promise of Jesus. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In a sacrament, we experience the presence of God with all our senses. 
and Jesus is with us still. In a profound and, as I hope to show eventually as the summer goes on, real way. Listen to what Thomas Cranmer, the English reformer, has to say about this subject. And I uh, ask for your patience with the 16th century English, but your ear will get tuned to it by the end of the passage. <clears throat> this is Thomas Cranmer. So that the washing in water of baptism is, as it were, showing of Christ before our eyes as a sensible touching, feeling, and groping of him to the confirmation of the inward faith which we have in him. Isn't that great? It's a showing of, of Christ before our eyes and a sensible touching, feeling, and groping of him to the confirmation of the inward faith which we have in him. And for this cause, Christ ordained his sacrament in bread and wine, which we eat and drink and be the chief nutriments of the body, to the intent that as surely as we see the bread and wine with our eyes, smell them with our noses, touch them with our hands, and taste them with our mouths, so assuredly ought we to believe that Christ is a spiritual life and sustenance of our souls. Like as the said bread and wine is the food and sustenance of our bodies, thus our Savior Christ hath ordained sensible signs and tokens. Sensible, meaning approachable by the senses. Sensible signs and tokens whereby to allure us and to draw us to more strength and to more constant faith in him. In Cramer's view, God is concerned that we experience him and are drawn to him by whatever senses are necessary so that he, so he provides that drawing strength via all the senses. <coughs> a sacrament is a sensible sign, a picture to all the senses of an invisible reality. Isn't that great? God is interested in sensible signs, and so he's put them in our way so that if we're not words people, we can receive and understand the love of God in Jesus in another way. <coughs> but there's an objection here. Follow me. If this is true, then, aren't all of God's created works sacraments? I mean, Paul in Romans chapter 1 says, look, look around. The evidence of God's nature and his Godhead is all around you. In every rock, in every tree, in every element of the created world, it all testifies to the nature and existence and glory of God, right? I mean, we can be, if we have the eyes to see, we can be reminded of God's power looking at a mountain, right? Why can't we be reminded of Christ's nourishing power to the soul while we nourish our bodies with a pizza? If it's just an analogy, that's as good a one as any, right? I eat a pizza, I'm not hungry. In the same way, Christ nourishes my soul. Can't we be reminded of his death and resurrection any time we dive in a pool? Or jump off a dock into a river? It's a going down into the water and a coming back up, isn't it? <coughs> isn't that what baptism is? I mean, it is true, after all, that thing about nourishment, that thing about death and resurrection. What does it matter how we are pricked to remember it? The other day I went swimming, and I thought as I dove in the water how Christ was buried after his crucifixion. And as I came up out of the water, I remembered his resurrection. And behold, I am encouraged and nourished, and the memorial of his death and resurrection is fresh in my mind. Why didn't God just say something like that? Hey, look around at food and drink, guys. Take a look at water every once in a while. They're everywhere, all around you. It's like that. Pay attention. Well, because it's not exactly like that. That's why. It's close, but it's not exactly like that. The scriptures are very clear, it turns out, that the power of God is at work in the sacraments in a special way, different than the shape of diving in the water and coming back up. Baptism is different than that. The power of God is at work in it in some special way. 
And that this special power communicates the reality of Jesus' presence and his work and connects the believer with that in a unique way in the sacraments. Look at Luke chapter 24. You guys know the story of the Emmaus Road encounter, right? Let me just jump to it real quick. A couple of disciples, 35, verse 35. Uh, have, are brokenhearted when they hear about Jesus' death and they're walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus appears to them and talks with them and, and uh, says, why are you guys so downcast? And they say, wow, have you been living under a rock for the last month? How can you have you not heard this? It was terrible. We thought he was going to be the savior of the world and he's dead and all is lost. And then Jesus explains why the Messiah had to die and they still don't get it. And he, but their hearts are burning within them. They say later, hey, stay with us for dinner. We think we want to talk to you some more. And he says, fine, he does it. When he was at table with them, this is verse 30 of Luke 24, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. I think this was accidental. I think their eyes were opened coincidentally upon the breaking of the bread. Neither do I. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? In other words, they had an ability to see what had been going on that was given to them in the breaking of the bread. Some sort of supernatural, spiritual change came over them in the breaking of the bread. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and here's the kicker, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. He was known to them in the breaking of the bread. In a way that he would not have been known to them had they just had a pizza, if you see what I mean. The sacrament carries power to enliven the soul. The passage that we already read from Romans chapter 6 is Paul's version of the same thing. We were buried with him through baptism into death so that we might be resurrected with him to newness of life. We identify in some spiritual way. We are identified with Jesus in baptism. When we take the sacrament, when we receive the sacrament, we are in some real sense, in some spiritual sense, with Jesus in the grave and with Jesus in in resurrection. So we could say, then, that all creation has a sacramental quality. That all creation, if you have eyes to see, draws the heart upward towards God. In fact, I mentioned this when I give a sermon on marriage. You guys remember um, me preaching about marriage in the last couple of years. I've done a couple of weddings, and I always say this. Marriage is kind of a weird combination of a covenant and a sacrament. I'm using the term a little bit more loosely. I don't believe marriage is actually a sacrament in the de by the definition that I'm giving here today. But it has a sacramental quality, doesn't it? On the one hand, it's a covenant where everybody's got to keep their side, and it's a contract, and you can break it or keep it, and blessings go to those who keep it, and curses come to those who break it, and everything's riding on you doing it right. On the other hand, it sort of doesn't work on the people that are involved in it. You get married, you, you submit to the sacramental quality of God's institution, and... You are step by step, day by day, line by line, prepared to be a husband in the, in the daily crush of marriage. It does its own work. In this way, all creation is sacramental. All creation does its work, if we have eyes to see, in turning our hearts to God and making us his children. But not everything is a sacrament in this sense. And this leads, of course, to other questions. It leads to other questions. If, and if not everything is a sacrament, what is it about the ritual? What is it about the Lord's institution? What is it about those particular physical elements, the water and the bread and the wine and the words that make it a sacrament? And how do they work? What actually happens when the bread and wine are broken and prayed over? What actually happens when in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is pronounced over the baptized person? What do they accomplish? How should they be handled? These are questions that I want to get into, and I want to talk about them at some length, but we're not going to get into it today. Today we're going to stop having addressed two questions. What is a sacrament? A ritual 
an observance instituted by Jesus to communicate in some substantive way the forgiveness of sins. And why does God command them? And the reason he commands them is that it's an offer to those of us who need to hear the word of God, the word of his love and grace, spoken in more than one type of language. And to those of us who say, I sure wish Jesus were here in the flesh. I sure wish I had a back to slap, if you will, so that I could be encouraged in my faith. Because whatever else we say about faith, it is a long and lonely road. And it feels like solitude a lot of times. I'll come back to what we've been saying about faith around here for a long time. Faith has as much in common with an empty hole as it does with anything else. Help me, Lord. I'm dead. you got to save. Or I'll be dead indeed. That's a long, lonely road at times. And a lot of us are standing here in the midst of it of us are standing here in the midst of it and have been there for a long time and we cry out to the Lord in the night please deliver me Lord and he's coming I know he is but when I do not know that I do not know that wouldn't it be great if he were physically walking beside us down that long lonely faith road I want to encourage you today that he is, in fact, physically walking beside us in the sacraments, in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. And so as we take the bread and wine today, I want you to remember that you eat the body and drink the blood of Jesus in ways that we will get into as we go along through the summer. But this is what it means when you eat the body and drink the blood of Jesus. First of all, that he is here with us your brother, your co-heir of all the promises. He is here with you in those elements. The Apostle John was right. The word really did become flesh and dwell among us. He is here in the breaking of the bread. He is here to be known in the breaking of the bread. And he will be with you down to the end of the age. Let us walk the road of faith with courage. We are not alone, though it feels like it in the darkest times. We are not alone. And the last thing that the sacrament means, and I want to impress that, this upon you today because an, uh, a sermon about the sacraments at the beginning of a series of sermons about the sacraments can seem like a harrowing, theologically heavy proposition. But this is what they all mean. Brothers and sisters, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. You stand in the Holy of Holies on the back of Jesus, the slaughtered lamb, pure and spotless. So as we take the elements today, I want you to remember those sins. I want you to count them. I want you to name them. I want you to say them out loud to yourself. These are the sins of which I am guilty. And I want you to remember that those very ones are the ones that Jesus washes away. And come to the Lord's table with confidence, with confidence that he has made a way. Be encouraged today, my friends. We live in a sacramental world. I want to talk for the rest of the summer about what an encouragement that can be. Hopefully we are off to a good start. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, not leaving us alone to walk the road of faith <coughs> blindly, but that you have given us uh, physical markers uh, to uh, hitch our wagons to, as it were. I pray that you would deepen our understanding as we start discussing these things, that you would always encourage us with your grace and with reminders of your unfailing love and attention. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.